Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great turnout. Great to see everyone. Um, and we have a very special speaker today, Terry Rockefeller. Um, and Professor Rockefeller uh, got his PhD from Harvard in 63 uh, with a thesis entitled Convex Functions and Dual Extremum Problems. And uh, from 66 on, he was a professor uh, at the University of Washington in the math department. And uh, his fundamental uh, work in optimization and uh, non-smooth and set value analysis has uh, had tremendous impact and has been recognized by uh, numerous awards, including, for example, the Danzig Prize by uh, Siam and the John von Neumann Theory Prize uh, by Informs. And I uh, just looked it up. He's been cited over 80, 50, uh, uh, 85,000 times and his monographs. Uh, have become standard texts in, in research and, and teaching. And I, I think without further ado, um, Terry, uh, take, take, take it away. Well, the first thing I want to say is I miss Montreal. I used to have a pretty strong connection with Montreal. Uh, well, it even started when I was uh, still a, as a student at Harvard. I liked to drive back to my hometown in Milwaukee through Canada because it was more fun and I could stop in Montreal. Well, there was another language spoken, which intrigued me in those days. And then I, I uh, did a lot of skiing. I went to Santa del San Gabriel, did all kinds of cross-country skiing and visited. And anyway, it's, it's a wonderful place. Congratulations for being a wonderful place, Montreal. So now let's get down to some business here. I, I'm going to talk about something I'm really very happy about. You know, I have a very long career, and I, I, I like to think that I discovered things in my career. Uh, one of the issues that I worked on for a very long time in so many different ways was uh, second order optimality conditions. So in convex optimization, you don't really need a second order condition because in a way convexity itself is a second order condition. But in non-convex optimization, how would you do that? So you could have generalized derivatives or something or other, but what is the key to it? Well, finally, I think, at least for some important area, I think I really discovered that convexity was somehow, even in non-convex optimization, the key to this. And this is what I want to try to explain to you. But we have to, first of all, go to what, what it is about uh, sufficient conditions and optimizations. Yeah? I'm going to try to convince you that convexity has a very deep tie to that, and also that it's extremely uh, valuable in analyzing numerical methods from this angle. So uh, we all started in calculus with the idea of necessary and sufficient conditions, one dimension, first order, second order, all of that. We know all of that. But that classical idea of second order conditions had a different mindset from, from what we now think of in optimization theory. Uh, in the classical th case, which it, the idea was you would directly verify these conditions, that is, you would have some candidate where you would use first order conditions to find some kind of a set of candidate points. And then you would use a second order condition to eliminate the ones that didn't match and, and or to see which ones really were uh, locally optimal solutions. But that's not the way we look at it now. In modern terms, the first order conditions more or less stay the same in a sense. But uh, we, we're interested in the design and justification of solu solution methodology. And uh, we're looking at second order conditions from the, that point of view. What second order condition uh, version of strong second order, whatever second order guarantees this or that kind of convergence. Uh, and, and we're not asking to have the second order condition therefore as close to the first order condition as necessary, but rather just to see what kind of second order property will work for our method. Uh, now, now uh, if we just look at the most elementary, well, n-dimensional, so it could be one-dimensional, it'd be more n-dimensional smooth uh, minimization. We have a, a function that we're minimized, C2 function, let's say, and we're looking at a point and we're interested in the local optimality of that point. Well, we all know that the first order condition uh, is that the grade or, gradient should be zero and the second order is sufficient. Remember, I'm interested in sufficient. Sufficient condition would be that the Hessian matrix is positive definite. But now if you think about it, because, because we're, the function is C2, 
if it's positive definite at this point x bar, the second the Hessian is positive definite on some convex neighborhood, and that means that the function is locally convex on a neighborhood, even strongly convex through positive definiteness. So, so this, this basic condition is a condition for that function to be strongly convex on the neighborhood of the point. Uh, but that seems like an extremely limited idea. The question I want to explore though is, is there some greater version of this, a, a similar reduction in other cases? And do su sufficient conditions entail it or should they entail it? Is that the key to get, having a good sufficient condition for local optimality in the sense of its usefulness? Uh, so then let's look at the next simplest case of, of familiar to, uh, familiarity to us in optimization, the case of classical nonlinear programming with, inequal, with equation constraints only. So I have function f0 and constraint functions fi, and they're equal to zero uh, on those constraints. And then I have the usual Lagrangian function. I like multipliers y because of the duality with it. I like the duality. So x and y are dual, right? So my multiples are y's, not lambdas. So, uh, I, so uh, we look at the, we're back into the uh, classical conditions of Lagrange here. Uh, for this problem, the first order optimality condition is that the gradient in the x argument should equal zero and the gradient in the y argument could equal zero. And remember, Lagrange would just uh, come down to the, the whole Lagr gradient equaling zero, and he kind of didn't think that much about the second order part of it, but that's the first order part. Well, what we know for the second order part of this in nonlinear programming is that you should look at the subspace uh, of the uh, active constraints, uh, or sorry, the subspace where the active constraints equals zero, and you should have uh, the that the Hessian should be positive definite relative to that subspace, the Hessian in X, not the X in both variables. Uh, but there's another way to look at this, which is not so obvious, but now it's more important because we also know about augmented Lagrangians. So in this classical case, the first where augmented Lagrangians were augmented is uh, the, where you just add to the Lagrangian function squares of the constraint functions. It's a sort of a hodgepodge where you're adding like the quadratic penalties for the constraints to be zero. You're adding that penalty to the Lagrangian. That's the augmented Lagrangian. And in terms of the augmented Lagrangian, those conditions that are, are, that are, are written there, these kind of standard second order conditions, they're equivalent to saying that the augmented Lagrangian for high enough, high enough value of R, the augmented Lagrangian will locally have a convex concave type of saddle point there. And moreover, in the X argument, it will be strongly convex, whereas in the Y argument, it will just be concave, but you'll have a saddle point. Well, that, that is the uh, hallmark of convex duality. Primal and dual problems, you have a saddle point of some convex concave function, all those in that case on some neighborhoods maybe. So there's something that somehow basically that classical condition reduces in principle to local convex concave saddle point and thereby duality. So something is in there. This was not really noticed by all the people who uh, earlier on anyway, except by uh, Dimitri Bertsikis in his early work on augmented Lagrangians. Let's look now at, uh, now I'm going to go to a much, you know, we always have to find the intermediate platform to talk about, uh, the Goldilocks platform, not too simple, not too general. So my Goldilocks platform here is what I'll call generalized nonlinear programming. Yeah, yeah, generalized, but I have a specific idea. So uh, what, I, what I want to do here is I want to think of minimizing the sum of the function F0 and then uh, the comp composition of a vector of function, of the vector of functions, I still have these functions, F1 up to Fm, we're gonna compose that vector with a function G, which is simply a closed proper convex function. So you know, if the G was the indicator of a set, then that would mean that F of X should belong to that set. So I would be getting back to a, a typical looking uh, constraint, but I wanna feel this more generally. I believe it's so valuable. So as I say, if you take this G to be indicator of a set X, 
uh, k, then you have constraint f of x is in k. But you could also take g to be a norm, for example. And then you'd have some sort of regularization idea. Or still another one, because here's how you get non-smoothness. You could take g to be what I call the vector max function, the max of the coordinates of a vector. In that case, you'd be minimizing f0 plus the pointwise max of these other functions. Well, those are all you know, the component ideas. You could mix those all together. You could have, uh, you could divide your vector u into various subvectors and have different functions of this type applied to subvectors. So this is actually a very general modeling thing that it can include non-smoothness, uh, penalty functions, various constraints, regularization terms. So it would all come under this heading of generalized nonlinear programming. And it has the key that any kind of smoothness is in on the functions little f and capital F as the vector. But the non-smoothness and, and everything else is represented by the choice of this convex function g, which I call the modeling function. Right now, uh, I'm, I'm going to end up with duality somehow. And the way you get duality is by introducing perturbations. Dual variables are dual to some kind of perturbations, typically canonical perturbations. So here's a version of canonical perturbations. Uh, I was originally minimizing this F0 plus the composition of G and F, but now I introduce this perturbation in the G function, G of F of X plus U, and U is a perturbation vector. So the problem I'm interested in is where u is equal zero. But if you like, you could think of this as a constraint, a u equals zero, and you can introduce a multiplier for it. So, uh, so what this leads to is a Lagrangian, which is defined uh, in, in this slide by the first blue line. I'm using a little l now for the gen these general Lagrangians. Little l of x, y is obtained in principle by minimizing in u this function phi of x u minus the, the multiplier vector times u. And that comes out in this case as giving the standard Lagrangian as we had earlier, minus the conjugate fu convex function applied to the multiplier vector. So, and then the augmented Lagrangian is of defined, this is their general theory it goes back to the seventies. And it's also in my book, Variational Analysis, a lot of this. Although here I'm going beyond things that were in that book. So, so, uh, uh, you, so the augmented Lagrangian, you, you, you also have this general, it's valuable to have a general formula. And, and so you, you just minimize in you, the difference is that it's in the middle blue line now in this here, that you add the square of the no, Euclidean norm of the perturbation vector, and you minimize that. Then depending on what G is, you can work this out in more de detail or not. So we're in the Goldilocks place where I'm just going to put at this point that the, the augmented Lagrangian has two ways to be expressed in terms of G or its conjugate, which I don't really want to go into in detail, but, but you can work them out. And the, the basic result is that if, if those functions, Fi functions are all L1 functions, then your augmented Lagrangian will be an L1 function. But if they're all C2 functions, or C, so I say L1, C1, and C1. If I say, if they, if they are all C2 function, it doesn't mean the augmented Lagrangian will be C2 because there's some aspect of non-smoothness, but what it is, is L1 plus, that is SS C1 plus. It's continuously differentiable and the gradient gradients are, are um, uh, locally Lipschitz continuous. So the, the case that they call conic programming is the one where we're using the indicator of a cone K. G is indicator of a cone K. And then there's a polar cone, which I like for reasons explained to call Y. So that's a dual and to X, uh, to, to the X thing. And so I have polar cones. In that case, these functions are just distance squared functions for those sets that enter into this augmented Lagrangian. So, what are, so in this, in this uh, uh, model, you have uh, first order conditions, and then I'm gonna get on to second order conditions. That's the real thing, but first we have to see what the first order conditions would look like. So I'm looking at this function phi of x u, where u is a perturbation vector, and that's going to be lower semi-continuous proper uh, function, not convex, uh, subdifferentially continuous and regular. These are terms of variational analysis, which I'm 
not going to go into. Uh, but, be, but because of those nice properties, the subgradients are what we call regular gradients. We don't, I don't have to mess with the more complicated subgradients. Regular subgradients are defined as in convex analysis, except with a little O term, as an inequality. And then the first order condition here in the setting it can be expressed uh, in terms of uh, this. I'm interested in a point X bar and a multiplier Y bar. And the first order condition is that the pair zero Y bar should be a subgradient at the pair X bar zero. And under some constraint qualification, this is necessary. Again, that's not our topic because I'm interested more in sufficient conditions uh, and, and second order conditions. Anyway, though, this first order condition can be expressed with the augmented Lagrangians I introduced. And it looks very much like Lagrange's basic condition. It comes out that the gradient of the augmented Lagrangian in X should be zero and the gradient in, in Y should be zero. Now, the augmented Lagrangian is always gonna be concave in Y, so that would mean that Y, that the Y bar is an arg max and a dual argument. But, but still, this condition with the gradient equal in both primal and dual arguments it would be the first order condition for a saddle point uh, of this augmented Lagrangian occurring at X bar Y bar, but just the first order condition for that. Now in convex optimization, that's you can define that here and justify it as the case where the augmented Lagrangian is convex in, in X, uh, then, then you would end up having a global saddle point. But we could also, instead of asking for this augmented Lagrangian to be globally convex in X, we could ask what about a local saddle point, which, which is what the thing that came up in classical nonlinear programming. So um, this leads me to introduce a concept that I, I, I came up with several years ago out of necessity. And um, at first it seems uh, it's a little hard to grasp for people. So I need to explain this carefully. Um, uh, so I'm talking about a function in general, some low, lower semi-continuous proper function, and I'm gonna assume these other subdifferential continuous regular. These are minor uh, extra conditions and variational analysis, which eliminate some you know, nuisance, nuisance issues. Uh, and then and under these assumptions, the subgradients are are the ones given by uh, the, uh, the regular subgradient set is there ones given by an inequality as in convex analysis, but with a little O error term. And then variational, con let me say before I get into this de 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 definition, variational con analysis is a condition that depends a variational convexity. A it's a local condition that depends on the choice of a primal vector X bar, but also a dual vector in this case, V bar, a subgradient at X bar. And, and, and the point of it is, will be that under this condition, in terms of subgradients and the values of the function attached to the subgradients, it's impossible to distinguish this function F from a convex function. If you only had that information, the subgradients locally local subgradients around these, this pair of points and the function values associated there, you could not tell a difference whether there, this was a, con, uh, it was a convex function. Okay, so the technical definition is, okay, there are neighborhoods. I'm looking at a neighborhood X times V of this point X bar V bar. And in this neighborhood, I'm going to say that there's a convex function that does exactly the same thing. This convex function H, it's less than or equal, it's important, it's less than or equal F in general. And its subgradients in these neighborhoods are exactly the same as the subgradients of this F in this neighborhood. And for the pairs in this point in this set, the two functions agree. So in other words, you could not distinguish between F and G if you only had this information of these neighborhoods and these subgradients. So that's variational convexity at F at this point. Seems very obscure in how you will find it, but it has very strong implications. Okay, so, so, and then there's a strong variational convexity or variationally strong convex. That's where 
this this function f is strongly you cannot strongly a convex you couldn't distinguish f locally from a strongly convex function uh, and and I, and I was able to show this is what generated this definition i was able to show and, and, and that that um, that this corresponded exactly to the subgradient mapping of f being maximal monotone locally around this point we have all kinds of theorems which say that if the function is convex, then the subgradient ma uh, mapping is ma maximal monotone. But, but what about locally? If you want local maximal monotonicity, that is a monotonicity property relative to some neighborhood of this point, what is the property of the function that corresponds to? Well, it's exactly this, variational convexity. Now, uh, just uh, you now, if you had this property, and then you you take the, the the subgradient to be zero, so you're looking at zero in f of x bar, then it implies that f is a local has a local minimum there, and you can see that because after all, you can't distinguish it from a convex function, and that convex function has a, has zero as a subgradient there, so you certainly have a local minimum. And strong variational convexity corresponds to a tilt stability of this minimum. So now we're getting into a property which has a lot of meaning for um, applications, variational applications. I mean, here, here are some illuminating examples. So, uh, why people people seem to think, what? Why why doesn't this mean local convexity of the function? The thing about local convexity is local convexity occurs when you're just making a restriction in the domain of the function itself. But here we're also making a, a, just a dual restriction to the subgradients of the function. That's what's, what's more special about it. So in one dimension, for example, you could, you could take a function I've shown here, which you could think of as a pair of wings with a point sitting at the origin. It's you you take take the absolute value function and subtract a square function. So the wings sort of soar, soar up and eventually droop down, and it has a corner point at the origin. Now it's not it's just concave to the right of the origin, convex cave to the left of the origin, it has a point. Still, it's variationally convex around this pair zero zero, the origin. Why? It's because if you looked at the subgradients of this function, because of the corner there. The subgradient mapping, its graph has a vertical segment. That vertical segment is locally a maximal monotone relation. Well, that's kind of extreme little example, but it shows you there's no convexity involved there. All right, on two dimensions, uh, this is more illuminating from a different point of view. You take a function whose effective domain is just a parabola. And then you add a, a, a linear thing to it. So it's a kind of a linear function restricted to a parabola. <clears throat> and this turns out to be strong, very strongly variationally convex at the origin. The, the, the effective domain isn't even convex, yet it's strongly variationally convex. And you can see that because you can test the tilt stability. If you were to tilt it a little bit, the minimum just moves in a nice way and so forth. And what you can think about this is this is a, a function that represents the essential objective in a nonlinear programming problem with a parabolic constraint. So there's something in here about constraints <clears throat> and, and, and second order sufficient conditions. We're getting close to that. Uh, oh, yeah, question? Just uh, the function before the, the two dimensional example, I'm not sure if I understand it um, or is there, um, X two minus parabola. X, X one two equal X one squared, and I define the function outside of that parabola to be infinity. Um, that parabola, I associate the the X two coordinate of the value of the function. So if you want to think of that parabola as opening upwards on the plane, and 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 with with height height values v two X two. The function of the value is the height at that point of the parabola. Okay. The domain of the function is just the parabola. And now, of course, it has a unique minimum at the origin, this function. But now if you were to tilt the function a little in any direction, it's only going to tilt the function in a nice way along the parabola. 
then we'll have a tilt stability property that we know is equivalent to this strong variational convexity because it's a property connected with maximal amount of tonicity. So this is, this is a, a good example for seeing, you know, that there's something to it and it's definitely related to optimization, but it's not that not local convexity. All right, now remember our problem here is I have it with a perturbation uh, parameter is to, ha I have this function with, uh, you see my cursor when I move it? Yeah? I don't know. Yes. Anyway, you have uh, the per perturbation parameter here. Uh, and uh, and now I want to observe that if I were to add, here's a, that's this, if I were to add to this function some multiple of the perturbation norm squared, to, uh, some multiple r, so I get function phi sub r, that wouldn't affect this problem because the actual, I mean, in a sense of what we're really doing, because we're interested in minimizing subject to u equals zero. So adding some function of u wouldn't affect the problem that I'm actually minimizing in the end, but it does have a profound effect on Lagrange multipliers and other things. Indeed, this is somehow how augmented Lagrangians appeared instead of Lagrangians. But also uh, this, this trick of adding such a term doesn't affect the first order condition for much the same reason. The first order term uh, that, that square of the norm vanishes at the origin. So the first order condition carries over to this augmented uh, perturbation of function. So, so here now I explain what I mean by the variationally sufficient condition for local optimality. I introduced this in a paper on decomposition, by the way, and I, eventually it's going to get back to applications more in that. But so the, uh, this idea is you take the first order condition and you combine that with the condition that this augmented objective function should be in the two variables, should be variationally convex at this x bar zero for that multiplier vector zero bar. These are the elements of the first order condition. That's the variationally sufficient condition. And there's a strong version where that the phi r is, is strongly uh, variational, it's variational strong convexity at that point. And why is this a sufficient condition in the first place? It's because again, uh, that the variational sufficiency or con con variational convexity involves some convex function that's less than or equal to this, and you can't distinguish the subgradients, and so that would and 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 if you looked at this for a, it, it reduces the case as if this phi r were convex, and there this would be the the, the condition for a local optimality there. Uh, so it seems that how would you ever verify this? Well, there's a it's another matter I'm going to get to. So now, but here, so here, so the strong version, what does the strong version do? Okay, now remember we have this function phi r and we have these gradients. So one connection is that the strong version uh, corresponds to a, a quadratic growth condition. I won't go through this, but there's a lot of theory in, in, in optimization about quadratic growth conditions and how they should play some role in sufficient conditions and how they affect uh, uh, the uh, justification of algorithms and so forth. That's very important. So, so you can just see uh, quickly that strong variational sufficiency is something that should tie in with that. Uh, but here's another thing which is also very illuminating just to see where this fits because it, it, it does seem obscure at first. So, so uh, suppose you drop, drop my, my Goldilocks problem and just assume that we're minimizing a C2 function phi of xu subject to u equals zero. And uh, then, then, we, then we could look at this phi r, I'm just adding this r times the norm of u squared, and I could look at the gradient of that at the x bar zero, but that just reduces to the gradient of phi at x bar zero. Then it turns out that strong variational sufficiency corresponds exactly, you know, as defined in my general definition, corresponds exactly to the following conditions which you would immediately recognize as the second order optimality conditions for this problem, that the, the gradient of phi should be perpendicular to the subspace where u equals zero, and that the, the uh, Hessian should be positive definite relative to that subspace. So that's just a natural classical conditions of optimization. So what we're doing is replacing a smooth function by a non-smooth function and getting exactly the substitute for that. 
much more generally and seeing how it plays out into constraints and so forth. So um, now, now, we cut, now here's a mean theorem, uh, mean theorem one. Um, so I, I'm, I'm assuming at this point just that the functions are, are C1, not the phi function, but the fi functions are C1. That's all I need for this theorem. That the variational sufficient condition for local optimality, this is for some X bar local pr proposed optimal solution and an associated multiplier vector, uh, and, and a parameter vector R, that, that's a parameter vector R occurs in that special condition. It is equivalent. This is equivalent, equivalent, equivalent to the existence of a convex neighborhood on which the function is convex, concave, and you have a saddle point relative to that neighborhood. So this, this fundamental core idea of duality and convex optimization, that you have a convex concave function on a product of sets, and uh, you have a saddle point there, and that leads to local primal and dual primals, that that, that kernel of an idea of duality in convex analysis is exactly equivalent to this sufficient condition being satisfied. So whenever you can show that, you know you are in a domain somehow of local convex analysis. It's amazing. So by local duality, I mean that this is just goes back to basic two-person game theory and convex analysis. You, you minimize, you maximize in the the dual argument to get the primal objective function, and you minimize in the primal argument to get the dual objective function. And then having a saddle point uh, corresponds to saying that your, your X bar point minimizes, solves the primal problem, the, the dual vector solves the dual problem, and the min equals the max and the two problems. This is basic duality. So this is a, 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 a a very fundamental fact about convex duality in a local sense be corresponding to a sufficient condition that naturally generalizes the one of calculus for this situation. Okay, now what about the strong version? This corresponds to the to the augmented Gaussian being locally strongly convex. That was the property I pointed out at the beginning that was occurring in classical nonlinear programming with equality constraints. But here we're way, way beyond it, just that. But there's a, this also ties in with another property which you can uh, recognize as being uh, valuable in, in uh, computation. So th this, uh, this same the strong version also corresponds to to what's called, I call augmented tilt stability, which is now defined in the middle. You look at the mapping. So I have a tilt vector V. A tilt vector V subtracts a linear function of X from the augmented Lagrangian uh, in the two arguments. So I so I, I I take from I take a tilt vector V and I take a dual vector Y and then I look at the minimum in X. But it's, it's a local minimum over the set, which where you have this strong convex, this convexity, and and then it's a tilt. And the problem is property is that this function should be Lipschitz continuous, single valid and Lipschitz continuous locally, and that ties in very strongly with the theory of methods of multipliers, where you do minimize in X augmented Lagrangians and so forth. So um, now. And now I want to connect with previous conditions for sufficiency. So how does this play in? I already showed you that classical condition for sufficiency just from calculus. So there they were equivalent. But now let's look at classical nonlinear programming where you don't just have equality constraints, you have inequality constraints. Well, so this is a case where G is the function, is the indicator. My modeling function G is the indicator of a standard uh, constraint cone, and that's polar to the standard multiplier space for this kind of standard nonlinear programming problem. And, and what does the strong variational sufficiency condition mean in this case? It's exactly equivalent to what's called the strong second order sufficient condition. So we're dealing with exactly the right generalization of that nonlinear programming condition. 
We're not, by the way, we're not talking about any linear, any constraint linear independence. That's a different matter. Another example where you get complete equivalence is in second order cone programming. There is a, a version of sufficiency and, and, and that's been promoted by a number of people, uh, uh, Boris Morhovich and his uh, collaborators and so forth. Uh, and um, again, you can show that this, the condition is exactly equivalent to that. But, but then you can go further and into domains I can't discuss here because my time is short. Uh, so you, you can look at what this condition means in terms of certain kinds of sec generalized second derivatives of the Lagrangian, and you can write up various conditions like that, and you can see how it would work out. And you can also introduce generalized quadratic forms. So there's a big, a big uh, body of theory you can build on this to work out exactly what it is. But it isn't exactly the same as what other people always have for their sufficient condition, because in some cases, they get sufficient conditions that are too weak to create the saddle point. Uh, so, so, so what? What's the interpretation of that? Well, I don't know. Maybe they're good for something. I don't deny they would be good for something. But what we know about this condition is it creates, it, it basically, if you're dealing with local analysis around an, a locally optimal solution, this is exactly the condition that propels you into the domain of convex analysis, where everything should work as, as if it would work in convex optimization. So there's something very fundamental about that. All right, now I'm going to conclude with a couple of things about augmented Lagrangian methods, ALM. I think I got very interested in, well, I was very interested in when the first came out back in the early 70s, and, and I had a role in the original development of it, but I've gotten back into it again more recently, especially because I'm using it for some kind of decomposition methods, but who, who are not doing decomposition? Well, what does it mean for this uh, problem I introduced that I call generalized nonlinear programming, where I'm minimizing F0 plus a function of a vector of functions, and that's a, some, low, some lower semi-continuous convex function G. So there is, I've already defined these things. There is an augmented Lagrangian, and I'm calling that L sub R for some positive R. And uh, then I'm going to talk about an algorithm, the augmented Lagrangian method in this setting for this, this general problem. And remember, this includes non-smoothness, it includes uh, regular, uh, regularization terms, all kinds of things are included in this model. And for all of them, we have an augmented Lagrangian method you can describe as follows. So the main step is you're going to minimize the augmented Lagrangian in X. Ah, there's a mistake there on the right. It shouldn't have an XK. Yeah, it should just be X on, on the right. In the first blue line on the right, there should not be an XK. It should simply be X. So you're minimizing an X, the augmented Lagrangian, in terms of two of, of a, a dual vector y k prime, uh, multiplied by n a mul and a, an augmentation level r k, so you minimize an x, and that local minimum will give you an intermediate thing x bar k plus one. But we can't actually get that x bar because that's exact minimization. So what I'm taking is an approximate minimization. So to, to get this in detail, I'd have to introduce an awful lot about errors. All of that's well developed, but I have to skip that for now. So I, I get some approximate minimum here, but again, on the right, it should be our xk, not uh, x, just not xk. All right, then after you got that xk plus one, then you update the multiplier to yk plus one using the gradient in y of the augmented Lagrangian evaluated with this xk plus one. But, but you have a multiplier vector, uh, an augmentation, a step size RK plus one. Uh, uh, but I have a prime on it. I'll have to come back to that in a minute. Why is there a prime on that? They could be the same. I could have RK equal RK prime. And I have non-decreasing parameter sequences. So the idea is when will this work? So your orientation is that you're going to try to initiate this so this is a, you know, we're dealing with non-convex optimization. Think of Newton's method or something like that. You have, to make something work, you're supposed to start close enough to a solution to, to be able to invoke your theory. 
Uh, it's certainly an important issue, how you're going to get close enough to a solution, but that's not what I'm dealing with here, or can deal with it in, in this talk, or even know how to deal with it in general, necessarily. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, but could also be that you're just updating from a previous solution you already had. So anyway, you're starting close enough to uh, a, 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 a pair that satisfies the, the, the strong variational sufficient condition. <clears throat> And then you are uh, doing this approximation, this approximate minimization uh, with inexactness and in such a way that you're not straying far from this locality. All of this in a paper I've written, I've, I've worked out a lot of details about how this takes place and how, how you can make sure it works and so forth. And then the idea is when you do this, can you get the X bar to uh, converge at a linear rate, our linear rate generally is all you can get, and, and any of these algorithms to X bar, can you get that in a local thing? And basically the answer is yes. So, uh, but how has this come about and how is that related to what I've just been talking about? It's related because you can show that the uh, augmented Lagrangian method as I've described it here, corresponds to applying the proximal point algorithm to a local dual problem. Now, in the augmented Lagrangian theory that I was involved with back in the early 70s, this was uh, one, of, one of the things I, I uh, uh, brought out in the subject, that in convex uh, optimization, when you apply the augmented Lagrangian method, you are basically solving the, the dual problem by an augmented by a proximal point algorithm. But now we're not in convex optimization. But I'm able to show, this is for the first time, that even so, under my, the circumstance I've described with this, this kind of variational sufficient condition, it, it is true again that the augmented Lagrangian corresponds to solving a local dual problem. What local dual problem? What's the one that comes from the saddle point? That saddle point problem has a dual problem, and what you're actually doing is solving that problem. And then you can use basic properties of the proximal point algorithm, uh, it has convergence properties, and then you show that they lead to linear, this R linear convergence of the augmented Lagrangian in, in you know, most, most common circumstances. Uh, I had to actually work, uh, well, I've, I've also worked it up uh, recently, uh, this past year, on getting even sharper convergence properties to the proximal point algorithm to enhance all of this. But, but there's another kind of, kind of surprising insight that comes out of this because, um, it turns out that in most of the analysis that people have done in the augmented Lagrangian algorithm, uh, they, they were, they were uh, I mean, for, for say, for nonlinear programming, going back to Ewan Hestonies and Powell, who first did that, and, and even Bertsikas, who analyzed that a lot, um, they might have the wrong step size rule. They, they simply take, if I go back to what I had earlier, I had this R, R prime and an R, two, two different parameters. They, for them, the R prime is always equal to the R. But what I'm able to show is if you do that, then generally speaking, what you're doing is not the, uh, you're, you're still using the proximal point algorithm, but you're using it with a kind of uh, uh, relaxation that was introduced by Bertsikas and Eckstein. So we're using a relaxed version of the proximal point algorithm, but in, in, in the, the work that uh, my former student, Taimu Penanen, uh, did on using a local version of the proximal point algorithm, he showed that you, you, the, the relaxed algorithms deteriorate the rate of convergence. So anyway, there are interesting things that come out of this that are very deeply ingrained in this. And then there are other things. There are, uh, there's, uh, I, I started out getting into this, but through all the decoupling methods, I'm very interested in, in all kinds of ways of decoupling, using augmented Lagrangians, despite their reputation for screwing up separability and all that, uh, using them to, to uh, solve problems in a decoupled manner. And then, then there's also something in a bigger picture that, that this is what I did with generalized linear programming. And I have 
uh, ideas beyond that where this pretty much works, but maybe it goes in much other areas that, that if, you, if you were to consider localization primal and dual localization, that convexity will somehow come into, the, into view and this could have far reaching potential. And for instance, there are infinite dimensional areas like optimal control where something like this needs exploration and nobody has done anything like it. All right, well, that's the end of the talk except for the references. And, and here you see, uh, uh, well, the first is a, a paper I gave that introduced variational convexity. And then there's a paper, these things you can all get from my website. Uh, then there's this paper for uh, progressive decoupling, and those are in print. Uh, then there's the one that uh, uh, basically the main thing about this talk, which actually was virtually accepted six months ago. But for some reason, the last epsilon is taking forever. Uh, it should appear in mathematical programming. And then uh, submitted this summer to mathematical programming is, is something, is the application of this to um, you know, augmented Lagrangian methods that I've just been describing. All right, that was the end of the talk and I seem to have been on time, that's good. Okay, beautiful. Um, I think we have plenty of time uh, for uh, questions. Please uh, write questions in the chat or unmute yourselves and, and step up. I, I can also get the ball rolling if people are too hesitant. Okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll start with a question. Uh, you 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 hinted at that uh, I think uh, before. I was I, I was wondering um, about second order characterizations of these uh, variational convexity and strong var variational convexity um, in terms of the, the co-derivative of the subdifferential operator, is there, is there anything uh, one can use? Um, well, uh, well, strong variational convexity, there is. And it's actually in an earlier paper I have on prox regularity. Uh, there's something about that that corresponds to it. Yes, it's positive definiteness of that subdifferential. That's right. But that doesn't work for the, that only works for the strong variational convexity. There's no analog, at least established at this point for the, for the other one. But I also have to say, Tim, that in, in this work, in that, that paper, uh, the paper three here, uh, I, I found that um, I, I had to go a little beyond the, the co-derivatives. I, I, the, the problem with the co-derivatives, although I've been a big fan and I, I love it and all of that, uh, they introduce something extraneous in certain situations, something unsymmetric, which uh, is a little hard to deal with. And I found a way with the, uh, with the Lagrangians themselves to, to end up with something more symmetric as a substitute, which seemed a little sharper than using the co-derivatives. Okay. It's all in that paper three. Uh, okay, okay. Um, well, I have, I have more questions, but please, uh, people, uh, step up. I think people are very shy. Well, it's easy to hide on Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. You could, I, you can't, could, I can't hide, but everybody else can. Yeah, you can also type questions in, in the chat. I heard something. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll go, go ahead with another question. Um, in the in the uh, augmented Lagrangian setting, um, you you're probably assuming that you're solving uh, the the sub problems like the finding the minimizer in in X of the augmented Lagrangian little L R uh, globally, right? That's local local minimization. Oh, okay. Well, all this depends on uh, on having a, a well. What's behind it, of course, is the assumption that I have a, a, a local saddle point, with, which is strongly con convex in the X argument. So there is this, uh, another line convex set. But of course, in the algorithm, I can't necessarily know that I, I know that set. So the way I set up the algorithm, I have something like a, um, oh, what's it called, a trust region that I move around and hope that, hope that, I mean, uh, 
this is this of course is a weak point that needs a lot more work so um I'm, I'm just falling back on the theory. I mean, what if you're doing like say Newton's method, you can't start anywhere and expect it to work. And somehow you're supposed to be in the region where it works. How do you know you're in the region where it works? So, so there's some, somehow there's uh, more work, more has to be done to make that all fit. But what, what I'm able to show is if you are close enough and then uh, you're moving around, then you, you have this, this set, given set that you're working with uh, trust region and you and you and there is an, a unique um, minimum over that trust region. Right. Okay. So the algorithm is well defined in that sense. But how do you know you're there? That's the big if. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, we 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 really have some time for questions here. We can also have more tea. <laughs> well, um, if there if there are no further questions, then let's please all uh, thank uh, the speaker again. Thanks. I was glad to do this. Thank you uh, for the invitation. <laughs>